Wayne's going to bring that slide up there somewhere. Hopefully he's getting me online. Good morning to those of you who might be watching online this morning. Today we're going to be talking about making rest. Keeping our souls making rest. Have you ever, have you ever seen a child who's overtired? You know what it's like when a child gets overtired? They refuse to, to sleep. I remember when, when we were bringing Victoria, we used to live in Arizona, as most of you know, and so we were only about five hours from Southern California, and our kids lived there. So there was one year that we had brought, when Victoria was just really little, two, maybe three, that we bought annual passes because we could buy the California annual passes, and that was like when Disney was cheap. It wasn't cheap, but it was sure a lot cheaper than it is now. And I remember we bought these annual passes because they were only good in SoCal. You couldn't go on the weekends. You could only go on the weekdays. But Monday was our day off. So we'd sometimes drive over on Sunday night, go on Monday, and come back on Tuesday. And we'd go into the park with her, and she would be so overstimulated. She'd be watching everything. She would refuse to take a nap in her stroller. And you know what happens to kids when they won't take a nap when they're that little? They get cranky. They get mouthy. They get whiny. And stuff, and, and you try to force it. Just, mom and dad know it's best. Just take a nap. We'd roll around, and I remember we come out. We she'd be awake the entire day, and by the end of the day, she's like. <laughs> and we were at the end of the day, we're going out of the park. We weren't two feet out of the park, and her head's like boom over the side of the over the side of the the stroller, just out like a light. But sometimes we're she was fatigued by that point. Her brain had so much overstimulation with it's a small world and Pirates of the Caribbean, all the different things that go on. Didn't it? Her brain was so overstimulated and she was striving to take in all that she could. And it was a busy day and there was energy and movement and all kinds of things. And by the time her soul was just downright tired, her physical man, her mental man just wiped out. And that's often the way we are in our strivings in life. There's a story of an American devotional writer. She traveled to Africa as a woman, and she hired a group of guides and people. They were tribesmen from out of the jungle tribes in Africa, and they were strong people, and she hired them to carry her things and to guide her on her journey where she needed to go, which was quite a distance. And the first day they set out, and they just, because she was in a hurry pushing to get there, they just went further and further. They did miles the first day, and this is on foot. This is before the time of, of cars. And they pushed and pushed and pushed to get ahead. And the next day, when they, when they went to get up, she was up. She was all ready to go the next morning. And there they were all outside, and they were sitting down. And she's like, I'm ready to go. And they wouldn't get up. And she's like, it's time to leave. And they're like, they refused. Frustrated, she went to their leader, who she had hired. And she goes, look, I hired all you people to take me on this journey. I'm ready to go. We need to get moving. And he said, he said, first day they traveled too far. They traveled too fast. Now they're waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. They might have slept the night before, but their souls still haven't caught up. They were, they were weary. They were tired, not just physically, but they were tired in their minds, in their brains. So much stimulation, so many things have come upon them. And she noticed in that moment, she took away from that experience that, that in America, that all of our whirling and rushing around in life, just it's like that first day of that journey to those tribesmen or like a kid in Disneyland. The difference is that they knew how to stop and restore life's balance. Well, we're not always very good to do the same thing. Have you ever felt that need? You know what I'm talking about. I know you do. That busyness, that striving, and, our, and we're going, and, and we're just, we realize that, that we're so worn out, not just physically, but in our spirit, man, in our soul, because our soul needs rest. Say that. Your soul needs rest. Now, more than ever before, our society is experiencing what one book that I've been reading lately calls soul fatigue. Soul fatigue. And soul fatigue affects our relationships. It affects other people in our lives. It affects our relationship with God. When we become, when our soul becomes so fatigued, our soul needs to come and experience rest on a regular basis. Some indicators of soul fatigue would be when things bother you more than they should. Like right now, you might be noticing that the person next to you is chomping their gum and it's really annoying you. You might be fatigued. 
you know, or, or that, those little things at home. You know, the toothpaste cap on the toothpaste. You know, sometimes when we're souls fatigued, little stuff bothers us more than it should. Or you can't make up your mind in a simple decision. I'm not talking about a big life decision, but I'm talking about simple decisions. When we just can't decide what it is or make up our minds. When we are, our impulse is to overeat or to drink or to, to spend money or cravings, when they become harder to resist than they normally should be, our soul might be fatigued. When we're willing to favor short-term gains, even if they leave us with high long-term costs, when our judgment begins to suffer, when we have less courage, those are all indicators that our soul could be fatigued. And we need to come back and rediscover the peace of the Lord because the Lord has called us to experience his peace. We read it at funerals. I've read it a lot in the last couple of weeks, that scripture in, uh, where Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives I unto you. You know, we, we, we need his peace, but, but we're not stopping to receive it. Just saying, okay, Lord, I receive your peace. That's the beginning. But sometimes we have to hang there to allow that rest to come in. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you, what? Rest. I will give you rest. He calls us to come and lay our burdens down. He comes us to call and rest in him. And he's given us a very practical way in scripture that shows us just how to find that rest. It's very simple. And it was instituted and given as an example to us at the very beginning of creation. When at creation on the seventh day, what did it say God did? He rested. He took the seventh day realizing that, now, do you think God really needs to rest? No, but what he did was he, he ceased all activity. It doesn't mean that he stopped sustaining the world or maintaining it. But he ceased from his creative nature. He ceased from his creating and striving to create the world for mankind. And on the seventh day, he rested because he wanted man to realize that we need to, after we've been striving and going, there's a time that we have to cease and rest. It's the one commandment that the church has really in the last couple of decades has started to live in the loophole. You hear what I'm saying? You know, we all like loopholes to covenants. You know, what's a covenant but a contract? And who doesn't like to find a loophole in a contract? Why I don't need to do what I just signed on the bottom line to do. We all like to live for the loopholes. And that loophole's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the church, and we're becoming more and more tired. I'm not talking about going back to a legalistic state of Sabbath. But what I am talking about is realizing that Sabbath was for our benefit. There's a place of rest that God designed, and not only did he give that at creation, but he gave that in his Ten Commandments. The ten key life structure verses that tell us these things we need to do or avoid doing to live in harmony with God and to live in harmony with other people. And when we stop doing that, you know, the world's pretty stressed out these days. You see it on the road, road rage and anger and offense and everything like that. People are stressed out. Why? They have ceased taking rest. And then when they go to take rest, they fill their rest with activity. You know, I sometimes realize that when you go on vacation, going to Disneyland is not vacation. It's, 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 not, it's activity. We go and we find things to do. You know, Kimberly and I have found the joy of not having children at home and going, taking a break and just floating on a boogie board in the water, looking at each other and just chilling out. Waking up late in the morning, having devotions, spending time with the Lord, and just, that's rest. The first thing we need to do is we need to come back and rediscover or discover the Sabbath again. Let's talk about that, discovering the Sabbath again. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Okay, holy means set apart. A day to set apart. Because it was the day when he rested 
from all his work of creation. He ceased from striving in all the work that he had been doing. He set apart the last day of the week. And he did it to show us to let our soul catch up with all of the striving that we, knowing that we needed a day to rest physically, mentally, but most of all, spiritually. And then when it was time, he put it into the commandments. Exodus 16, 22, 30. I want you to read this because at this time, you have to remember, the Israelites were still marching around in the wilderness. So every day was a busy day, setting up tents, taking down tents, walking wherever God was leading them, following the cloud if he was leading, taking care of the needs of things. And we know that because they had no crops, that God every day was giving them manna and quail from heaven, and they would have to go and gather the manna and the quail from heaven, and they could only gather enough for the day. If they tried to gather it and keep it over for the next day, it would spoil. But in that process, God didn't want them to gather any on the seventh day, so he gave them abundance, a double portion on the, on the um, sixth day, so on the seventh day they could rest. It says, on the sixth day they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set it aside what is left for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor, which is what it would have been any other day of the week. That is a supernatural movement of God that happened for 40 years in the wilderness. Okay? Every sixth day, there was twice as much man and quail that they could prepare and instead of it spoiling overnight, it would last only on the sixth day. And God did this for 40 years. Think about that. That's a supernatural occurrence. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. I'm gonna, I, I know better than God. <laughs> aren't, we, aren't we so typical? Human condition hasn't changed much, have we? I know better than God. I'm going to go out and find manna. Ah, but it's not there. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? You all realize that God never gives a command or instruction. He never said, don't do this unless it was for our protection or for our provision. And when he says, do this, he says it for our protection and our provision. Because God doesn't give us these guidelines to be mean or, or harsh. He, get, he shows us these things to help us. Verse 29 says, they must realize that the Sabbath, the Sabbath, what's it say? Is the Lord's gift to you. Say that. The Sabbath is the Lord's gift to me. Say it again. The Sabbath is the Lord's gift to me. One more time. The Sabbath is the Lord's gift to me. Wow. See, we've had a completely wrong idea of what that was. And we totally ignore that today. It says, that is why it gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. And on the Sabbath day, you must each day in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. The Sabbath is God's gift to us. And for years and even after they came into their own land, and even to this day, devout Jews still devoutly practice Sabbath. Uh, uh, a Hasidic Jew or, 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 or devout practicing Jews, they have kosher kitchens. They have kitchens where they, they, they separate milk product from non-milk product. They're still following some of the Old Testament law. But the one thing that they're very faithful to do is to prepare food on Friday so they don't have to prepare it for Saturday. And they're not allowed to turn on lights. They can light candles, but they can't. They, they can't turn on lights. They're not supposed to ride in cars. They're not even supposed to clip their fingernails. I looked up lists of the forbidden things on Sabbath. They were so long, I'm like, I am not going to put all that in my notes. I mean, that, they're like pages of like just length after length of things. But rest assured, really what it was coming down to was that we would not work on the Sabbath. That there would be an active 
ceasing from all labor, commercial and domestic. That when the Lord rested on the seventh day, it was an example to us for us to do the same. But why? Because God realizes that we all need at least one day each week to cease from all of our striving. And if you look at our lives between between sports and school and jobs and different schedules and errands and other things we have to do, we have ceased to honor a Sabbath in our life. We have ceased to take that time to let go of the physical and the mental and the spiritual striving. A day that our soul can find rest and peace, even if that peace is being forced upon us. A day to cease from hurrying about so we can focus. And what are we focusing on? Jesus. If you go back to that verse in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29, after Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest, he says this, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. The New King James, the King James would say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your souls. You see, when we take that time to cease from all of our striving and focus on Jesus, it is in that place that our soul actually finds rest. Now, when it says yoke, we often think of a yoke of oxen. You ever know, you know, when they have two oxen and they got the big wood yoke on them and they're going forward and they're pulling the cart or whatever. And, you know, we always would kind of say, well, you know, Jesus is carrying all the weight, and then the smaller, weaker oxen is just kind of following along. But really what that word yoke means, if you look it up in the Hebrew, is it's talking about when the disciple pairs with the rabbi or a teacher. And what Jesus is calling us to do to find that rest is that we would take time to come and to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him. And learn of him. And that's why in our, in our current day it's so important for us to have that place where we come into the community of believers, where we come into a place of worship with the Lord, and we sit at his feet, and we we commune and we learn from him, and we take his word into our spirit that our soul might find that rest. There's an example of this in Scripture with Mary and Martha in Luke 10, 38 to 42. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Ring familiar, any of you ladies on Christmas Day or guys? Come on. Everybody's in the room watching TV, talking, and I'm up here doing all the work in the kitchen. Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. But there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. You see, Mary chose that which was important, to sit at the feet of Jesus. To come to Jesus with all of her burdens and her her weariness and that which, which weighed her heart down. To come to him and to sit at his feet, to pour herself out, and to learn of him and to learn the rest that he had for her because she was discovering the presence of Sabbath in her life while she was in the presence of Christ. And need I say that we as Christians need to discover the Sabbath once again, that place of rest, that place of residing in his presence. And in order to do that, we need to close the loop. The next thing, close the loophole. Close the loopholes. I'm not advocating for legalism. I'm not advocating that we go by and we have a list of 2,000 things and we check it off that I didn't do any of these things today. Because if you did that, checked off that list, that would be work. You would be striving at that point. Jesus understood that, that the Sabbath had just become a legalistic ritual to people, but it wasn't a place where they were coming and abiding in the presence of God so they could find the rest that would truly nurture their spirit man or their soul. And he, and he told them that Sabbath was, it's not made for, it's not made for man to, to, to be obedient to the Sabbath. It's, the Sabbath was made to help man out. And there were things that he did on the Sabbath that he was criticized and judged for. But he's like, no, no, no. 
This is for the need of man. It's okay. But you know, Jesus, when he came to earth, he didn't throw out the Ten Commandments. He didn't say that those Ten Key Commandments had no viability anymore. In fact, if you look at Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, when he talked about murder, he said you shouldn't even be angry in your heart at another person. That's as bad as murder. He didn't just talk about committing adultery or fornication and the actual act of sexual activity with another person. He actually said if you lust at another person, if you look at another person visually and sexually in, in your eyes and begin to, to fantasize, he said right there you're committing adultery in your heart. So what do we do with the statement about the Sabbath? In Mark 2.27, 20, it says, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So how do we honor this commandment in our life? We recognize it's for us. Just like not committing murder benefits us, doesn't not committing murder benefit people? Isn't that a good thing? Just like not committing adultery benefits your marriage, and the same as not looking at the person with lust, the same in keeping that day of rest, it's for us. It's for us. The loophole came because right before that in the scripture, he had been plucking grains of, of wheat to hand to his disciples because they were faint and going to faint. It was the Sabbath day. And they were going to faint, and he didn't want them to faint. So he plucked the, the, the wheat, was right there, he plucked it and gave it to them. Another time he made similar words because he had healed a man who was deformed in, the, in his hand. Luke 14, 5 says, then he turned to them and said, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? Sorry, I jumped ahead of myself there. There was a man whose hand was deformed, and he healed it. And he said, the needs of man, this man's healing is more important that he's healed, even if it's on the Sabbath, than if he goes through life maimed. And in doing so, after that, he said these words I began to read in Luke 14, 5. Then he turned to them and said, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush to get him out? Okay, he's giving the loophole here, which is if someone falls into a pit, you're not going to say, oh, it's the Sabbath. You're going to have to wait there till tomorrow. I mean, are we going to do that? Sorry, I don't care if you're bleeding to death. Just stay down there. I'll be back tomorrow. No, he says, of course you're going to go and rescue him because you're meeting the need of mankind. You're meeting the need of a, of a man. Well, in the case of a cow, not a man. You're, you're going to rescue them because Sabbath was made to meet our needs. And so there are times where sometimes that need is right there, just like the man with the deformed hand or the disciples about to faint. That's why we can't become legalistic in that approach. But, you know, we've come to live our life with the cow in the ditch. True? We've come to live our life with the cow in the ditch. We're always, we've made that loophole so big that we, it's almost like we, like we throw, throw a pile of hay in the ditch and say, go eat, cow. And then that gives us an excuse to just do our own thing. I don't have to go to church, i got to go to work. I don't spend time with Jesus, and I don't time spend with Jesus. i got to go to work, i got to go do this. You know, the smart thing to do is if your cow's in the ditch every Sabbath and you can never take a Sabbath, you fill the ditch. Or if the cow's too stupid, you kill the cow. We don't keep on letting the same situation arise. Because what we're doing then is in all of our busyness, we're saying it doesn't matter if I take care of my soul. And who's the one who suffers when we don't take care of our soul? We do. I'm pointing to myself. I do. You might notice I don't always answer my phone or text back on Monday because it's a Sabbath day for me. A time to rest, a time to be with family. And, and, and I need to have that time away from the stress and the striving of, of, of what we do in ministry and what we do. Because if I don't do that, then I can't refresh to be there to, to help if I need to be. We all need, we all need that Sabbath in our life. The Lord doesn't want rest stolen from you. He gave us the Sabbath because he cares about us. If we go back to those words in Exodus, he says the, the Sabbath is a gift. Think about that. Isn't it a gift to find rest? Not an extra day to run errands. Not an extra day to, 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 to just fill our lives up with other stuff. But a day to focus ourselves on God and communion with God and fellowship with God's people. 
and be still so our souls can catch up. Our souls need times of solitude. Now, wanna let you wanna just say a couple of side notes here real quick. Um, we, we go, people say, there's an argument in the church. Why don't we go to church on Saturday then? Because, because that's the Sabbath. Okay, let me tell you why. In the body of Christ, what day of the week did Jesus raise from the dead? On the first day of the week. What day of the week did the Lord give the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and give the birth of the church? It was on the first day of the week. And we practice a celebration of bringing our first fruits of our lives and worship to the Lord by coming on the first day of the week and giving the beginning of our week, starting off our week in the presence of God, giving him our first fruits and celebrating with him. Because then we're putting our focus on the Lord and we're starting that day off. So what we need to also realize is that a Sabbath day began at, at sundown on Friday and it went to when the first three stars appeared in the sky on Saturday or the last day of the week. That was the period of Sabbath. So it was actually from what we would call the day before until the next evening. That was when they practiced all of those things of Sabbath. And there's, we need to realize that in our lives there's a couple ways. The Sabbath was always combined with coming and focusing on Christ or on God, the Lord at that point. But now we focus on Christ. And there's a couple ways we can look at it. That either Saturday becomes our day that we give to rest and let our soul wind down and, and relax. So that way when we come to give our first day of the week to the Lord, we're refreshed already so we can openly hear and listen to what God wants to say to us. Or we can say, I'm going to start my Sabbath. I'm going to keep it still. I'm going to keep that day for, for as a Christian. I'm going to just practice that. When I come to church on that Sunday, that I'm coming in to give my, to take rest and to calm my spirit down, to come into the house of the Lord, so that way I can then take the rest of the day to rest in God's presence. And I've already, I've already merged my heart with the heart of the Lord and can now go forward with that. I don't think God is legalistic about how we approach that, but he's just wanting us to make sure that we have that. Does that make sense? To have that time to close out the clutter and rest in solitude because that solitude liberates ourselves from the pressure of this world. And if we take time to allow our souls to rest, then we can experience the peace and the joy and the love of God. If we take time to worship and if we take time to calm our spirit, that we can receive all that God wants to pour into our lives. But if we're always so busy and striving, we walk in a church busy, we walk in a church all... We, we sit there, we kind of get through the service, we go out, we go back to our busyness. And we really have done nothing to help our soul. The last thing I want to talk about this morning is the rhythms of work and rest. A survey of 20,000 Christians revealed that most of them identified busyness and constant overload as a major distraction from God. That our busyness and constant overload in our life Distract us from God. Well, duh. Doesn't that just make sense? The survey showed that as Christians, we assimilate into our worldly culture of busyness and hurry and overload. And that because of that, our lives become more marginalized in our relationship with Christ and that relationship deteriorates. And then we become more vulnerable to accepting more worldly assumptions on how we're supposed to live. And the cycle just continues until we're pulled away from God. And even though we might take time to physically rest, if our soul hasn't had that time to rest and to focus on Christ, then our spirit man has not been fed. Our spirit man has not been given the rest that it needs. You know, I love the fact that in the cool of the day, before the fall of man, that, that Adam and Eve would come and fellowship with God in the cool of the day. Every day there was time taken to rest in God, but still, they were still honoring, there was still a knowledge that that seventh day was still rest. Pick your apples beforehand. Jesus gave us an example how to combat this busyness in our life as well, not just on the Sabbath, but daily. In Mark 6, 30 to 31, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So what did he do? He stole them away so they could rest. 
And if we, Jesus had this habit. Have you ever read the Gospels and noticed that after Jesus had just given and given of himself, he ran away up into the hills or the mountains and just got alone with the Lord, with his Father, and prayed? Because even though Jesus was fully God, he was still fully man. And his physical man and the soul that was inside of him still needed a place of communion and revitalization and refreshing. And the example we see of Christ is that we still take time, even on a daily basis, to get away from all the stuff and take some moments to rest in the presence of the Father. And even as he did that, he calls us to do the same. You know, we always talk about, you know, we should read our Bible and pray every day and go to church, all those do's and the don'ts that we should do as Christians. But did you know why? I'm a why person. I drive my wife crazy with why questions. She's like, you always have to know the whys. Because whys just help me make sense of things. Prayer isn't to, to like, you know, it's not like this, this, this ritual that we do. You know, I mean, some churches, they've got the beads and they're flicking the beads and they're, they're saying the rote prayers and reciting them over and over again. And they're doing their duty. Mm-mm. God's calling us away to sit in his presence and commune with him so he can refresh our spirit, man. So he can refresh our soul. So he can minister to us. You know, one of the things that I used to always, I I realized one thing that during COVID that I actually began to teach myself was that even in all the busyness and the demands of things in ministry and many people's lives and things, there's a certain time that I have to take every day, and I do it now before I start my day, that I have to take in God's presence. And I won't hurry myself anymore. And I go earlier if I know that I have an appointment for some reason, but I try not to set appointments too early in the morning so I don't have to worry about that. That I take that time of that presence and communion with God so I know that I've had that solitude with him and my spirit is refreshed because how can I give out if I'm empty inside? And we try to go through our lives always giving out to other people and doing things and going through things, but where our soul is so empty because we've not found the rest and the refreshing we needed in the presence of Christ. We have to find that rhythm of work and rest to come to him with all of our burdens, to lay them down at his feet. So in conclusion this morning, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to bring back the Sabbath in your life. If you have not set that, not a day for errands and and where you're off of work so you can do all this other stuff, but a day to let go of all the mental stresses, to let go of all the physical striving and mental striving so you can truly rest and focus on the Lord so that way your heart and his can become one and your soul, because your soul is which is eternal and your soul was created to commune with God and if you rob your soul of that communion, you're going to get distracted and overwhelmed and realize that God calls us into rhythms. There is times that we need to work but there's also time that we need to rest. And just as Jesus made a habit to daily go and retreat from the work so he could spend time in the presence of God, so we need to do so to restore our soul. So if your soul is fatigued, get it some help. If your soul is is fatigued, close the loopholes of all the excuses you made why you don't need to have a Sabbath and realize it's time to take care of the need and let God begin restoring your soul in your life. Would you bow your heads? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Just bow your heads with me. The goodness of God cares about rest for our soul. You know, one thing I think that COVID did in America was make people realize that our rhythm of work and rest in our lives wasn't healthy. Americans, we love to work some. We love to work and strive for more because the more we work, the more money we have so we can play 
and the more we can do stuff. And so we work more so we can do more, so we can enjoy more, but we never slow down. And we wonder why we feel so far away from God sometimes. Because the greatest need that our eternal man has, that our eternal soul has, is to commune with our Creator. We have the ability to just do that. We don't have to bring a sacrifice to the temple anymore or bring offerings. We don't have to do those things like they did in the Old Testament because Jesus made the way into the very presence of God and we've taken such advantage of that that now we don't even practice it. We call ourselves Christian, but the time following Christ sitting at his feet is often very limited, very small. And thus our soul becomes more and more weary and thus we become more and more tempted to sin and we become more and more struggling in things and our relationships become more and more uh, uh, contentious because we were created to have rest. God ordained that from the moment he made mankind that, that there would be a day of rest, of striving from ceasing, that we would cease from striving And that's not to guilt anyone here in this room or even myself today. It's to help us to realize that God loves you so much, he made this plan. The Sabbath is the Lord's gift for you. Our society used to never let stores or even restaurants be open on Sundays. You couldn't pump your car with gas, you couldn't buy a car, you couldn't go to the store and buy clothes. It was all closed down and then we started ignoring those laws. We started ignoring those things and then people got busy and they started having to work on Sundays. And you know, and in it we've just gotten so busy and we've lost the rhythm of finding rest in our lives and time with the Lord. But you know, you have the ability to set God first in your life, to set, to, to, to make a stand before Jesus and say, Lord, uh, and, and even man and say, I need one day a week to rest in God. That I can rest, my spirit man can rest, that I can focus on Jesus, that my soul can be refreshed. God is faithful even when we haven't been. But let me tell you, church, when we become faithful, his faithfulness pours out in abundance. So right now, wherever you're at right now. The Sabbath was made for your needs. It wasn't made to be legalistic, but it was made for our needs because God knew our frame and our makeup and our fallen state, and he knew what we needed, so he gave it to us. And just like a child who's overtired, who mom tries to say, take a nap, lay down, go to sleep. Sometimes we just got to curl up in the arms of the Father until he holds us so tight that we can't move and we begin to just melt into his arms and fall asleep and come to that place of rest where he restores our soul. You can't do that if you're always striving. So Jesus, right now I pray over your church. I pray over each person in this room and whoever's watching online this morning or whoever might watch this in the days to come, that, Lord, you would show us and lead us and guide us back to that place of rediscovering the Sabbath. That, Lord, we would choose to close up the loopholes and the excuses we make why we don't need it. And that, Lord, we would see the rhythm of rest come back into our lives by spending time in your presence. I thank you, Lord, because you promised us a peace that the world can't give, and it is so accessible if we would just take the time to rest in your presence and let it fill our lives. So, Lord, may we not be hearers of the word and not doers, but, Lord, may we be doers of the word today May we put into practice the word of God that we have heard, the demonstration from scripture that we have seen. 
that, Lord, as keepers of our soul, as keepers of this eternal being, that we would make right in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Would you say that sing it? Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, I give you your people as we go from church today. Lord, may your presence be upon us in our homes, in our workplaces, in school this week. And Lord, be with us as we run after you, even as you run after us, as we take time to rest in your presence and be glorified in our lives till we come back again next week. For we ask and say with me, church, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go today. Thank you.